Hey guys, what's going on? It's Phil Dan, and today we're going to talk about my bold predictions for 2020. We're talking about the modern baseball card hobby. I've got 10 bold predictions for you, starting with number one. The concentration of value across the top five to ten key names in the sport is going to grow. What do I mean by that? Well, you have a bunch of investors and even collectors in the hobby now that have kind of a investor-oriented focus, and I think that there's going to be more and more investors, speculators, even collectors seeking out the top names. Last year, towards the end of the season, it was Acuna, it was Trout, Soto, it was Tatis, and maybe a few other names to a lesser extent, Glaber Torres, Bellinger, Yelich, and Bregman, because there are less collectors out there that are going to see value in collecting a specific team and all the players of said team or collecting specific sets. I just think we're going to see more of a disparity across the value of the top five to 10 key names. So it makes it more important for somebody like you to look after a player that already has that market interest or one that might be able to break into that common market interest. Also a bunch of prospects out there that I didn't include in that five to 10 right now, but they could be part of that or maybe they won't. Next prediction, home run output for 2020 is going to be no more than 10% less than 2019. In year 2019, total home runs across the league were up 21.32% versus 2018. The reason for that being that the ball was slightly more aerodynamic. The way that it was manufactured uh, was in a way that changed the efficiency of the core, reducing drag, change the placement of the seams, and it made a huge difference. If you're to look at the numbers on a surface level of home runs hit versus attendance per game over the last five years, the uh, rightmost column is slowly decreasing. You see that from 2016, 2017. And all of a sudden, when the home run output decreases by 8.52%, you see a pretty big drop in attendance of 4.18%. So maybe that was one of the reasons why baseball did what it did. And Fred would never admit to that. Um, and in 2019, it seems like increasing home run output stymied some of that potential reduction in attendance per game, although it did decrease again 1.61%. This wasn't as much as the year that preceded that in 4.18%. But looking a little bit further, there was an article that was posted in Washington Post that actually made a pretty good point about the amount of home runs that were hit and that baseball was turning into more of a two outcome sport. Strikeouts as hitters were changing their launch angles to hit more home runs in the new environment, basically caused a lot less action in games. And on top of that, there's been some reaction so far in spring training, Masahiro Tanaka, among some other pitchers that have said that the ball just feels different. Uh, very similar to what Justin Verlander said in April of last year. I don't think that baseball can risk a huge attendance drop by completely changing the ball so the home runs are more in line with 2018. I also think that enough hitters made an adjustment where there's going to be more home runs hit regardless. Data analytics are improving, training's improving, revamped launch angle approach. I think this is going to cause what some might expect as a significant drop in home run output to be more minimal. Bull prediction number three, Topps Chrome Sapphire is going to increase in popularity. It's been a brand that's really taken off over the last three, four months, even if we go back another year or two years. Headlined by the Ronald Acuna bat down number to 250 base card. I think those base cards are going to be key. I think the recent increase of interest in the hobby that's led to a lot of the flagship base cards surging in prices, I think that's going to translate to higher Topps Chrome Sapphire prices as well. Topps Chrome Sapphire, of course, in 2019, they just about quadrupled the base print run to be about 1000 But if, again, looking at those prices of the Topps base flagship rookie cards and PSA 10s, given the pops of those, not just the current pops, but the expected future pops of some of those cards, if those are able to, to sustain some level of value consistently over time, then I think I wouldn't worry about the 1000 card total print run of the 2019 base Chrome Sapphire, but it'll be interesting to see what they do in 2020 if they do increase the print run again. I think that's very possible. Next bold prediction, Topps flagship is going to continue to increase in popularity, but without cannibalizing Bowman Chrome. I think that gold parallels, black parallels are probably still the way to go long term. I think they're still going to be king. I do acknowledge that a lot of the base 
PSA 10 flagship rookies have surged a ton over the last few weeks, over the last few months. But if I'm holding a gold, if I'm holding a black, you know, I'm not going to overreact if those base prices start to fall. So basically what I'm trying to get to is on February 10th, right? 2019 top series two, Fernando Tatis, gold. PSA 10s are selling for about 500 bucks. Base PSA 10s are selling about 50. So you get a multiplier about 10. Well, that multiplier has now shrunk over recent weeks to about times six. So if I'm a holder of one of those gold PSA 10 cards, and if the base card starts to drop, I'm not gonna overreact. I think that the base cards are going to have more downside volatility, not talking about in dollars, I'm talking about in percent actually, so in both. And, you know, just look back at last year, Cody Bellinger, his batting average dropped every month in 2019, right? Well, what happened as a result of that? The HMT 10, Topps Chrome Update Bellinger card and a PSA 10 dropped probably from about a high of 100 bucks to maybe 40, 50, 60% to about 45, 50 bucks. While that happened, the Bowman Chrome Autograph did not see that same downfall. Maybe it dropped 10, 20, 30%, certainly not 40% or 50%. Similar type of logic applies to the blacks, the golds. Um, one of the other things that affected that HMT 10 Bellinger card had to do with the PSA pop, the BGS pop increasing on that card. It's a base card. There is a relatively high print run as there is even more so with the Topps flagship. So I just think that golds and blacks are a little bit safer. Contrary to what other people might say, I do understand that these PSA 10s are more attainable. Newcomers might see that one first and buy it first without knowing anything. But I think more and more of the influencers and the social media influencers listeners will seek out some of these other cards, whether it's a Bowman Chrome Autograph, whether it's Topps Flagship, Parallel, Golden Black, or two I really like, maybe even Rainbow Foil. I think that they'll see the positive investment traits of those cards as well. The current multiplier of a guy like Tatis, or a guy like Bellinger, we're talking gold to base, PSA 10s, you know, it might not ever go back to the old levels, but I don't think it's going to stay at today's levels either. I don't think that Bowman Chrome is going to be canalized from the Topps flagship brand because, I mean, look at the pre-sale prices of 2020 Bowman. You have Dominguez, a uh, shortstop prospect from New York, has a lot of good stuff going for him, super young. And I truly think that his raw Bowman Chrome autographs are going to set a record for how expensive a prospect is right after release. I wouldn't be surprised if they sell for upwards of $750 raw. Next bull prediction, Bowman Chrome. Blue refractor autographs are going to become even a more optimal way to seek leverage of key players. So usually, you know, Slab Stocks, Juicer on blowout forums, they have multipliers, which are more of a general rule. I prefer the Juicer one myself, but Usually what I see with the blue refractor and Bowman Chrome autographs and with my speculation series, I provided a multiplier. Usually it was between three to four. And I find more often it's closer to three and a half, 3.75. But for key players, if we look at Ronald Acuna last year, his 2017 Bowman Chrome first autograph base versus a blue, the multiplier was actually between four to six. And this is pretty common with top players. So going back to the the players that garner the common interest of the market I think that taking leverage is always going to expose you to a little bit more risk. And that's what you get with a refractor of Bowman Chrome autograph with a serial number. But if you're feeling really bullish about a player, I think that paying 4x for that Bowman Chrome blue autograph is actually pretty smart because you're looking at a floor of around four, maybe 3.75x, and you're looking at a ceiling, as we saw with Acuna, closer to 5x to 6x. Of course, you can also seek out olds and oranges. You're gonna get higher multipliers for key players, same things, with, of course, with red and superfractors. But, you know, that's a lot of risk to stomach. Those cards don't come up that often. Sometimes I just don't think that they're a good buying opportunity because a lot of the times I think they're overpriced. Bold prediction number six. Tops is going to ensure that retail products stay strong, hence putting pressure on distributors. I buy a lot of wax for my side gig here, the Rookie Card Explosion Box, and I've talked to a ton of different dealers, whether it's shop owners or 
people that are setting up at shows that have a lot of wax and have that intermediary connection where they buy a lot of wax either from tops directly or from distributors and they blame a lot of the price increases the shortage of supply directly on the distributors and not tops themselves we know that tops is increasing print runs on a lot of these products in 2020 especially the ones that were popular in 2019 because they want to satisfy the demands of the end consumer they couldn't care shit about the middleman they don't want the middleman to be able to exploit the situation and basically what's happening now is most store owners that sell wax actually don't have a price until they know the amount they're getting and the price they're able to buy it at and in most cases they don't know that information until about a week maybe two weeks in advance sometimes it's two or three days before they get the shipment which is pretty crazy they'll set a price that ensures a fixed percentage of profit across all the products now sometimes they I think they tweak that a little bit based on the supply they get so if they get a little bit less they want to make the same amount of profit total profits versus the profit percentage so they might jack up the selling price because of that and consumers get squeezed from that this is something where I don't think the shop owners are prospering I think it's really the distributors are doing very well they're not being completely transparent about how much they have retail products for the most part have a more fixed price it's more normalized the price is stamped on the box and distributors have less wiggle room to be able to manipulate the price to benefit them. Is I think that Tops is going to increase the value of the stuff in retail so us consumers we don't feel coerced to buy the hobby product because in the past it's always been the way to go it's always given the best ROI but from what we've seen from Top Series 1 the retail was actually quite strong and I think that's gonna be the case not just for the products where it doesn't matter if you get a hit or an autograph wouldn't be surprised with Bowman or with Topps Chrome if they are to increase the value of what's in those products as well number seven the gap between PSA 10 and PSA 9 prices is going to widen in the short term so what constitutes the difference of a PSA 9 and PSA 10 price in the simplest fashion, a general rule is, or used to be, that you'd pay roughly one and a half times the amount for a 10 versus a 9. But as we've seen over the years, that has not stayed true. It's, in some cases, 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x, 6x. With the 93 SP Derek Jeter, it's 20x. With the Ricky Henderson 80 Tops Rookie, it's astronomical. So really, it's based on two things. It's based on the amount of investors that are seeking a specific card. Uh, this especially holds true for modern cards. This is probably the biggest driver. Investors, speculators, etc. aren't going to settle for the PSA 9. They get the one that's more of a sure thing. They'll pay the extra X dollars to do so. Now, the gap is also affected by rarity, um, especially with modern. It's also affected by rarity. All vintage sets, really. 93 SP with the Derek Jeter. You're looking at a pop percentage of well under 1% for that PSA 10. And even with modern cards, some cards are tougher to get. Might be a black parallel from Topps flagship. So the PSA 10 is going to be, you know, more than one and a half X. The variable that's changing in today's market dynamic is the amount of investors, speculators that are coming into the market. And they're going to be driving that gap to be much wider than it was in the past. Number eight, SGC, the grading service is going to increase its market share in the next, this is the next one to two years. So before Beckett, BGS had removed their guaranteed turnaround times, which I did in the middle of February. I already had this as one of my bold predictions. It really has to do with the whole notion that you can't exploit your current industry position forever because industry concentration right now across two different names is something that's been going on in this grading service industry for about a period of, I don't know, 30, 40, forever. And that's something that's actually unusual. You'd expect that that current dynamic would evolve. There would be another third company that would supplant one of the existing ones. Maybe one of the top two would end up folding for whatever reason. And PSA is not doing itself any favors. Sure, a lot of what they've done hasn't created any reduction in demand because there are a lot of people that are extremely loyal to PSA including myself right now, call them sheep for lack of a better term, that will push all of their business there for basically one reason, and that's resale value. The service is terrible. If you try to drop off a card with PSA at a show, super disorganized, flashback to 1980s, going to the DMV, 
15 employees standing around doing nothing, maybe three sitting down handling one to two customers at a time. They give you a sheet, you fill it out with a pen. Nothing's automated. It used to be three months for bulk service, and then it was four months, and now it's five and a half, six months. Now there's a million card backlog. Now we have all of this renewed interest in the hobby with a predominant focus towards base cards and PSA 10s. Hey, guess what, guys? There's a hell of a lot of those key cards that are being submitted right now. So that 1 million card backlog, you know, that wasn't because people were trying to get cards in before the prices increase. That price increase was fairly immaterial, 50 cents, and it only affected a subset of those who were submitting. It's gonna come to a point where people are gonna get fed up. PSA can't scale. They're not being transparent on what they're doing to enhance their infrastructure. I'm sure they might be doing something to make their workflow more efficient. Who knows? They've never communicated well in that department. So what does SGC not have that the others do? I would argue that the most important qualities in a grading company are the following four things. Number one, the grades are strict and accurate. And SGC has always had that reputation for vintage, for modern. Number two, grades are consistent. And I think SGC has excelled very well there. There's very few harsh words to be said about SGC in that regard. Number three, do they detect fraudulent activity, whether that's trimming, altered, or counterfeit cards? I think if anything, SGC has actually been in the headlines less than PSA and Beckett. Number four though, do they have the resale value? Right now, no they don't. So this is part of the bold prediction as well. Right now, an SGC 10 Gold Label, which is their highest grade, uh, it's really, to me, it's apples to apples with BGS Pristine. Maybe not Black Label, but BGS Pristine. But it doesn't sell nearly as much as BGS Pristine. It probably sells a little bit closer to, to a PSA 10. But I expect, throughout the course of the year, more and more people like myself, Elite Co. 3, Gary V, are going to get behind SGC. And that's going to drive not just the value of the SGC 10 Gold Label, but other grades as well. You're gonna see closer to apples to apples comparisons. Listen, the market for base gem mint grade cards of key rookies and flagship right now is greater than ever. And these cards prices are more volatile than ever, which means that it's more important than ever to get these cards back as soon as possible so you can make a buying or selling decision based on that. When it comes to top series two in a few months, once that comes out, I can see a lot of people submitting the base, the parallel versions of Luis Robert to SGC instead of PSA or Beckett. This one might not be incredibly bold, but prediction number nine, I think that 2020 Top Series 1 over the long term is going to outperform 2020 Top Series 2 or 2020 Tops Update, not both. There's a lot of key potential with some of the pitchers in that product, and I really like the top three. And bold prediction number 10. This is one that's probably going to get me some downvotes, but this is just what I believe. Luis Robert and Joe Adele are going to struggle out of the gate once they join the major league roster. I think that they could have incredible careers. I think that they could be great potential purchases at some point. I just think that they're gonna struggle right away. And why do I think that? Plate discipline, part of plate discipline is actually pitch recognition. Those two things are not in the strong suit of either one of those two guys. And I would argue that that is one of the most important characteristics that translates to being able to adapt to major league pitching. Fernando Tatis, he had a K to walk ratio throughout his minor league career, somewhere around two and a half. And he was a guy that struck out a lot, but he knew how to take a base. He had a batting average last year that was over 300, which if you look at underlying Saber metrics, his batting average balls in play was so high that most experts are actually predicting a batting average around 280, but he showed that he could make it work, and he had an issue with the strikeout. Now, Joe Adele and Luis Robert have K-to-walk ratios in the minor leagues around 3.3 to 3.5, and those K-to-walk ratios haven't gotten any better as they've ascended through the minor leagues. Even Frank Menachino, Luis Robert's AAA coach, said that he wishes he could have Luis Robert for another full year to see him fully develop because he's swinging at too many pitches. And I'm telling you, these major league pitchers are going to exploit that weakness. There's a greater chance that that happens than it doesn't happen. Well, you could argue, you know, Luis Robert, Joe Adele, they can contribute in so many different ways. Joe Adele is very fast. He's a great defender. Luis Robert also has great speed. 
In Robert's case, the White Sox don't like to steal bases usually. That's their general tendency. If he's not contributing with a bat, he's probably not going to contribute much in the interim with his legs. With Joe Adele being a great defender, doesn't really help your hobby values. So what do I think is going to happen after Joe Adele and Luis Robert struggle, as I predict? I think that that's going to push more money to two things. Value. So just like the stock market, right? Over the last four or five months, even before the coronavirus, a lot of people thought that equities were overinflated. So we saw a flight to quality in gold. Recently, over the last two or three weeks, we saw a flight to quality in U.S. Treasury bonds. Equivalent flight to value or quality in the hobby is, well, you could say vintage, but in the case of modern, it's Mike Trout. So I think Mike Trout's prices will actually increase as a result of some of these youngsters struggling. I also think with Joe Adele getting called up, I don't know if it's going to be at the start of the season. Maybe it's in late April, maybe it's in May or June. I think that means that more eyes, more wallet share is going to go to the top prospect in baseball by Baseball America standards, and one that has a lower bust percentage than those two, having a more mature approach at the plate, even though he's still at single A, and that's Wander Franco. And I think that Wander Franco's prices, after Robert and Adele get called up, regardless of how they do, will actually exceed Vladimir Guerrero's prices from last year. And you might say, well, Vladimir Guerrero was a better hitting prospect, he showed a lot of promise in double-A AA and triple-A. Also, he's got that tie with his father, who's a Hall of Famer. What I would say is we've seen the influx of money in the hobby just over the last year, how things have changed, how the landscape's evolved. And I would say that all of those arguments are of less importance because now there's more money to be spent on Topps flagship as well as the Bowman product. So I think that is going to push Wander Franco's prices to a level that we've never seen before for an unestablished prospect. That's what I have for you today. Those are my bold predictions for 2020. Shoot me a comment. Let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe. Phil LinkedIn out.